épisode 2. Hi, everyone, and welcome back to the Dirty Talk podcast. I'm Rain. And I'm Chris. And I have good taste in music. Generally, yes. I'm not sold on Neutral Milk Hotel. I'm still working on you with Neutral Milk Hotel. Eventually, you will get the genius that is Neutral Milk Hotel. You've been saying that for a few years now. I have also been telling you to check out some other bands over the last few years that we've been hanging out, and you have really enjoyed them. This is true. I've introduced you to bands like Slayer. Reintroduced. I'd heard of Slayer before. You had never been to a Slayer concert, but mm. since you have been hanging out with me, you have been to three Slayer concerts. Yes. Here's the thing is that Slayer only does one song. One song. Rain of blood from the sky, altar of death. They're a great band. All their songs sound different if you can hear the subtleties in their songs. Subtleties. All I'm saying is that I have now turned you into a Slayer fan. Uh, I'm a moshing fan, and Slayer facilitates moshing. I like any situation where people can consensually get in a group and shove each other violently with great respect. Okay, fine. Yes, Slayer is one of the better bands to go and mosh to. In my opinion, they are the best speed metal band of all time. I really like the moshing part of Slayer. I've also introduced you to Soul Coughing. Reintroduced, yes. Sorry, reintroduced. You had heard these bands before, but you hadn't appreciated them until I said, hey, here's this thing. This is what you can appreciate about them. And now you really like them. This is a fact. I also reintroduced you to Tool. <gasps> yes, I am shocked that it took me this long to truly appreciate and revel in the genius that is Tool, and I'm convinced that if there is an afterlife, it's hanging out in a comfortable bed listening to Tool for eternity. Tool sounds like heaven to me, like it's so ethereal. I can't believe that I heard Tool when I was younger and it didn't resonate to me to the level it does now because it's it's mind-blowing. I can't get enough of Tool. At this point, our listeners might be wondering what all this has to do with the title of this podcast. Yeah, what does all of this have to do with the title of this podcast? Because I'm not sure if you've checked, but the title of this podcast is... Um, Blood. Shall I explain what this has to do with the title of this podcast? Please do. One of my favorite Tool songs is Prison Sex. And one of my favorite lines from Prison Sex is... When I'm looking for temporary sanity, I always want to make sure that my hands are coated in fecal matter, blood, and ejaculate, yes. A little while ago, we decided that in honor of your newfound love of Tool, we would do a three-part series. The first episode, focusing on shit. The second episode, focusing on blood. And the third episode, focusing on cum. And when you think about it, these three substances have really shaped the course of human history and us as a species. It's true that these three substances have transcended all cultures and times. If you would like to 
have your voice included on one of the upcoming podcasts of this series, please give us a call and leave a message with come at our call in line. And what is that call in line, Miss DeGray? The call in line is 614-733-4739. Or 614-R-DeGray. That's DeGray with an E, not an A. That is 614-R-D-E-G-R-E-Y. Ready to get started with episode number... Two! Blood. <laughs> he said blood. And here we go. What's your type? What's my type? I happen to be incredibly fond of workaholic, neurotic, highly intelligent brunettes. No, your blood type. There are four main blood types or groups. Most of the people you know will be either in group O or group A. A few will be in group B, and fewer still in group AB. My blood type? Yeah, what's your blood type? I, I have no idea. Well, you're not alone because according to a recent Quest Diagnostic survey, only 57% of adults in the U.S. actually know what their blood type is. That low? And our very unscientific Twitter poll basically gave us the same numbers out of 156 votes. 62% knew their blood type. Huh. Okay. However, if you were Japanese, you would most likely know your blood type. It's estimated that up to 99% of all Japanese know their blood type. Almost universal then. Yes. And you know why? I do not know why, but something tells me you're about to tell me. I know why. It's because in Japan, they believe that a person's blood type is linked to their personality, much like how our astrological sign is used in the West. People believe this so much that they have daily horoscopes based on a person's blood type. What? Seriously? Yep. Huh. I did not know that. That's kind of fascinating and odd. You do know your zodiac sign, right? Of course. I'm a Virgo. And I'm a Capricorn. Right. And we're supposed to be completely different, right? Yeah. And did you know it's estimated that in the West, around 90% of people know their zodiac signs? Well, sure, that makes sense. And when you meet somebody, one of the things you find out about them is what their sign is, right? Hey, baby, what's your sign? So in Japan, it's extremely common that when you meet somebody there, instead of them asking, what's your sign, they're going to say, what's your type? Weird. That's fascinating and fucking weird. This belief in blood type is so pervasive in the Japanese society that they have products and services that are marketed to individual specific blood types. They have products specifically designed for your blood type? Like what kind of products? Well, they have chocolate bars, matchmaking dating services that are linked to your blood type, and they have condoms that are supposedly made to a person's specific blood type or the blood type of their potential partner. What, they're coated in some sort of A-negative blood thing? What? I don't think they would coat the condoms in blood. I am I am full of questions now. How would you have a blood type coordinated condom? Supposedly the materials in it are linked to the person's biology because people with different blood types are going to have different acidic levels. It's it's very non-scientific, I'll tell you this. That sounds like marketing to me. It's so common in Japan, this blood type thing, that a lot of anime and manga characters will have their blood type worked into their character role and they'll base their personality on what their blood type supposedly is. What are the different types of personalities associated with people's blood types? We're going to discuss that in a minute. What we're going to do first is take a test for us to figure out our blood types. Oh, cool. Okay. I have no idea what my blood type is. I'm looking forward to the test. I have no idea either. I procured us some Elden card blood tests online 
You can find these online for about 10 bucks. It's a home test you can take. You just draw some blood, put it on a card, mix it with some water, and it will reveal what your blood type is within a couple minutes. So we're going to go stab ourselves bloody for this podcast because that's how dedicated we are to high quality content. Exactly. And then once we figure out our blood type, we will see what our personalities say about us according to this Japanese system. I know what your blood type is. What? It's A for awesome. Oh, your <laughs> blood type is C for cheesy. <laughs> there is no blood type C. No, there is no <laughs> blood type C. I made that up. Yeah, well, it fell flat. Mm -hmm. You ready to head to the bathroom? I was born ready. Okay, we are in my bathroom because when you're dealing with blood stuff, you want to go to the bathroom. We each have our Elden blood kit here. We're going to find out what our blood type is. I'm curious. I have no idea. Uh, we flipped a coin. I'm going first. Right. Let's open it up, see what we got. Oh, there's a lot of stuff. Got one of these. Got another one of those. All right, so this is the Elden card. Let's read the directions because you always want to read the directions. Before you start doing things willy-nilly. Yes. Oh, it says read the instructions for use thoroughly before performing the test. <laughs> it's the first direction. All right, here we go. Oh, here's, here, look at that. They kindly provide you with color illustrations on how to do it. Separate the Elden card. So we've got all the sticks. Try not to touch the little arrows in that card. I didn't. Uh-huh. I don't want you contaminating my blood sample. <sighs> okay, so it says apply a small drop of water in each circle. Do not, don't touch the colored regions. So I get it. Apply a drop of water. Don't touch the region. Not, not in this, in the big circle. Those are the regions, the colored regions. Don't put the water in the, in the middle. Oh, gosh, that's Put not... it to the side. That was not clear. That's why I'm saying don't touch the colored regions. I thought you meant with the, the dropper. No. Here. That's yes, a drop of water. Yes, drop of water there. Jeez. That's why it says do not touch the colored regions. All right, all right. I'm an idiot. Ready? I'm yeah. I'm going to stick myself. Here comes the blood. Wait, how do I do this? Stretch and puncture the soft skin at the side. Push the lancet firmly against the skin. Okay, here we go. One, two, mm -hmm. three. Nope. Ah, I poked myself. And then you got the blood. And it's supposed to go onto this thing? Yeah, yeah. So one of those for each. There's your blood. Repeat pressing until a drop with a three to four millimeter diameter seam. You guess that, like that? You guess so? Is that three or four millimeter? Oh, yeah. Are you going to make sure you have enough blood, right? I'm sure I have plenty of blood. I think that's enough. Okay. Mm -hmm. So maybe squeeze my finger. Try to get more. Okay. Oh, look. Got a ton of blood coming out. Here. Here. A ton of blood coming out now. Oh, yeah. That's what you want. That's the good stuff. All that blood. Okay. Mm -hmm. Look at all this blood on my finger. Yeah. I think that's enough blood. Okay. Yeah, a little bit of blood goes a long way. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, now mix them all up. Okay. So it appears that, according to this, I am O positive because my only reaction is to the anti D. Okay. Right? Is O positive one of the more common blood types? Yeah, O is one of the more common blood types. Are you common? I guess I'm just a commoner. And I've got that positive. You ready to do yours? I am. Now that you've seen how it's done? Uh, yeah. Okay. Take two. I have my kit. I have my pipe it. I've got my stabby bits. My stirry bits. Don't need this. I'm not going to touch anything because don't I don't anything. want to contaminate it with my blood. No, keep your filthy blood to yourself. So you just twist it, uh, okay, there you go, and pull it out. And then what you have to do uh -huh. is hold it to your finger and press it in. It should shoot the needle in and draw the blood. Okay, I'm a little nervous. Oh, nothing to be nervous about. Okay. Just a little pinprick. 
I right. dealt with plenty of little pricks before, haven't you? <laughs> Shut your mouth. All right. I'm. I'm okay. I'm nervous. All right. So I just. I just yeah. I just put it in. Yeah. Press it into the side where it's nice and tender. It is. The whole okay, thing's okay, nice okay, and tender. Okay, okay. Press it to the side. It didn't hurt at all. Really? Uh, just push. Just. I'm having some issues. You. <laughs> You have done some of the craziest BDSM I've ever seen. Yeah, but I get nervous. I'm so sorry. Here, hold it. You hold it. You gotta put some pressure on it. And then I'm gonna come in with the assist. Mm-hmm. Ready? Mm-hmm. Hold it up. Hard pressure. Ah! <laughs> <laughs> okay! <laughs> She's bleeding. Ah! Massage that blood out. I am massaging it out. I've got blood. Okay, good, good. The blood so the, where do I put so it? So just set it inside there. Don't start mixing yet. You want to get blood from all of them. Uh-huh. There you go. Okay. Okay. And then just line them all up. That's a good amount of blood. It's flowing. Uh, yeah. I think it helps if you tilt your finger so you're getting the drop down on, on it. Yeah, yeah. So put your finger above the, the stick. Well, blood everywhere. Okay, there you go. That's good. So much blood. Oh wow, you're wow, you're a bleeder. <laughs> Bleeding profusely all over there. I think you need more blood on that in the room. Oh, oh you're just dropping it on the counter now. It's blood on the counter. I'm sorry. Right, that's enough blood. Okay, right? sure. Now start mixing. You want me to mix? Oh whoa, that's a lot of blood. Okay, okay, I think that's good. Yeah. More than enough blood. That big drop of blood she left on the counter there. Well, you stabbed me. I didn't stab you. I just helped you stab yourself. Well, it looks like. I'm common too. It looks like you both have the same blood type. Oh, I feel so if close this to you now. was done correctly, we are both O positive, which I think is the most common blood type. Well, I did not know that until now. Mm-hmm. 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 Excellent. I think we're done testing the blood. Time to carry on <laughs> with the rest of the podcast. There's blood everywhere. I'm a messy girl, Donnie. See you back in the studio. We're back from the bathroom, and we both discovered that we are O positive. Common. We're very, very common. We're very common. 37.4% of the population are O positive. What I found interesting about this is that we are two completely different people. But are we? We are. We have completely different personality traits, but according to the Japanese system, we are the same personality. We have a lot of very similar personality traits, man. Well, let's see what the Japanese have to say about our blood type. I'm listening. The blood type O is often described as, I don't know this Japanese word, Rakun gushi. Rakun shugi. Or optimistic. We're both supposedly optimistic. All right, well, that's bullshit. Exactly. You're one of the most pessimistic people I've ever met. No, you're one of the most pessimistic people I've ever met. You have a saying of bury your hopes and dreams in the ground, <laughs> beat them with a shovel, and then throw dirt on top of them. Correct. But that's, that's how I become an inadvertent optimist is by properly utilizing pessimism. They also say that type O people are outgoing, have (laughs) leadership abilities. I'm not, well... You can be outgoing and gregarious at times. And have leadership abilities under very specific circumstances. When I'm not busy hiding in a cave. They're able to set the mood for groups of people. Under very specific circumstances, yes. They don't care much about the little things. And 
their behavior sometimes freaks out more sensitive A types, which I could see. I think sometimes our behavior can freak out some people. Close minded people. Here's what doesn't really apply to you. It says they're often found at events. Um well, under very specific circumstances threading that needle, yes, I can be at events, but only one percent of the time. And O types are incredibly resilient and flexible, enabling them to roll with the punches. No. No, you're not resilient and flexible. Well, I'm resilient in that I'm the survivor and I can be very flexible, but this is starting to sound like a steaming load of bullshit, to be honest. How can you describe a whole population of people based on just four outcomes? If you look at the list of characteristics about the O group, just like if you look at any astrological sign, they tend to contradict themselves a lot. You're right. I have noticed that. Here's some of the O group's characteristics. We're optimistic easygoing. We are insensitive, which, yeah, I can be insensitive. Unpunctual, <laughs> which that's you. Calm. I don't know. Confident. Self-determined. We can both be confident and self-determined, right? I'm starting to sense that these specific characteristics are so all over the map that they could apply to any group of human. Yep. We are workaholics, yet flexible, romanticists. We are cautious, devoted, yet carefree, ambitious. We are trendsetters. We're independent, Yet we can also be an imitator. Uh, uh, what? That's just all over the map. That means nothing. Pretty much nothing. It's the same as I feel about zodiac signs. Yes, I know how you feel about zodiac signs. Oh, but they work, right? You're smirking at me over there. <laughs> when we compare our blood types and our relationship, here's what it says about two O people in a relationship. Though their honest attitudes can build a frank and open relationship, they tend to collide with each other when it comes to competition. Oh, that's kind of spot on now, isn't it? I could say that, but you could say that about most people, I think. Not everyone is as fiercely competitive as you and I. No, we are very competitive with each other. I'm more competitive than you are. No, you're not. Yeah, I am. I'm going to up you on the competitiveness here. I'm so much more competitive than you are. Psh So as we can see, this blood type personality is pretty much bullshit. Bullshit. Sorry, Japanese. But at least we got something valuable out of it because now we both know what our blood type is in case we're ever in an accident and need a transfusion. And we do know that we can share the same blood because we are the same type. There is a dark side to this, though. A non-positive side? Yeah, yeah. Unfortunately, when people start trying to group themselves by some random trait, discrimination often occurs. In what way? In Japan, there is discrimination by blood type. It's called burahara, which means blood type harassment. What? People start discriminating against people based on their blood type. This burahara has been found to be the cause of bullying among kindergarten children denying jobs to otherwise ideal candidates, and ending happy relationships just because people feel like one blood type is better than the other. But that's so arbitrary. Unless you're running around stabbing people and testing their blood on the spot, how would you possibly know what type of blood types they are? And how arbitrary is other forms of discrimination based on somebody's skin color, eye color, racial background? But those are way more obvious to see than than your blood. Like, that's on the outside. Like, how are you discriminating against blood on the inside? People in Japan know because it's on their IDs. They ask the question on work applications. And on Japanese Facebook, there is a little box for you to fill in what blood type you are. So wouldn't the people that have the bad blood type want to lie about it? Possibly, But if you have a rarer blood type, then you might actually embrace it. And it is believed that this discrimination is based on the population ratio. And as always, the minority population is discriminated against. So if you're in the minority, you might have minority pride. The other thing our test revealed about us is our RH factor. It did? Yes. We're both RH positive. 
for the Rh, you can either be positive or negative. Right. Another characteristic of blood is the Rh factor. Most people have the factor and are called Rh positive. The few who are Rh negative should not receive Rh positive blood. And this is where things get spooky. So spooky. Roughly 15% of the population is Rh negative. Although it isn't equally distributed across populations, it is lowest in Asian groups and highest in groups of European descent. Supposedly, Rh negative people are the direct descendants of the alien race that did the genetic brewing that created humankind from monkeys. So aliens came down, tampered with the monkeys, and left some of their DNA in us? Yes, or it could have been the Anunnaki, the extraterrestrial race that helped establish ancient Mesopotamian civilization. They engineered and crossbred humans, and that some part of this process created the Rh-negative blood type. That sounds like bullshit to me. But these theories were featured on ancient aliens. Well, then it has to be true. Of course. I mean, I'm not saying it's aliens, but... It's aliens. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Mm-hmm. Some people also believe that it validates the biblical story found in Genesis 6, 1 through 4. Genesis 6, 1 through 4. When men began to multiply on the surface of the ground and daughters were born to them, that God's sons saw that men's daughters were beautiful, and they took for themselves wives of all that they chose. Yahweh said, My spirit will not strive with men forever, because he also is flesh. Yet will his days be one hundred twenty years. The Nephilim were in the earth in those days, And also after that, when God's sons came in to men's daughters, they bore children to them. Those were the mighty men who were of old men of renown. Supposedly this group of angels and their offspring were wiped out in the great biblical deluge, the floods, although some were said to have survived And the survivors are the direct link to these angels by the Rh negative blood type. Okay, that is interesting. I've actually seen some references where people that are Rh negative think that they are an elite group and they're looking to only intermingle and have children with other Rh negative people because they think it's some sort of superior bloodline. Oh, yeah, yeah. There's a lot of organizations that get together and they have shirts and things that say, I'm RH negative. But like I said, when any minority population has something distinct about them, a lot of times they celebrate it. There are also some assertions that the European royalty and the majority of U.S. presidents are all RH negative. I don't know about that, but I do know that there's a lot of hemophiliacs. In royalty, yes. Yeah, yeah. Not, not in presidents, but those royal blood lines are actually not really that good. The thing is, is the Rh negative is a recessive trait. So, of course, when you start having populations interbreeding with themselves, the recessive traits are going to become more and more prevalent. And that's what they found in a lot of these populations of European descent, like the Basque, who tend to be isolated for millennia is they have higher rates of this Rh negative because the recessive has come out. All this has led to the Rh negative blood being called the bloodline of the gods. (laughs) There is actually a book written about this phenomenon called bloodline of the gods. Why do people believe there is so much significance to this Rh negative factor? Because it makes them feel special and everyone likes to feel special. Stop bursting their bubble. (laughs) Here is the argument that the book outlines. It goes something like this. The vast majority of humankind, humankind, 85 to 90 percent, is Rh positive. Which means a person's red blood cells contain an antigen directly connected to the rhesus monkey. This antigen is known as the Rh factor. Each and every primate on the planet has this antigen, except for one, 
the remaining 10 to 15 percent of humans. If the theory of evolution is valid, that each and every one of us is descended from ancient primates, shouldn't we all be RH positive? Yes, we should. But we're not. The negatives are unlike the rest of us. They are different. They are the unique individuals whose bloodline may have nothing less than extraterrestrial origins. The other evidence of this otherworldly origins from this selective blood type is how RH negative blood does not play well with others. RH negative can only receive transfusions from other RH negative, and if a woman who is RH negative becomes pregnant with a child that is RH positive, her immune system will create antibodies that can cross over the placenta and attack the fetus's blood. In these situations, the mother has to be given injections during pregnancy to stop her body from actually attacking the child, which can lead to lasting harm, birth defects, and even death. Some people argue that this is a reaction of the pure bloodline rejecting contamination from outside populations. Oh, the blood of the gods, the alien blood being so pure, it didn't want to be contaminated with that base monkey blood. You can't have mixing of the pure race with the unpure. This argument seems a little more like xenophobia to me than proof of extraterrestrial origins of the RH negative factor. The truth is, this RH negative factor came around like every other trait did, like blonde hair or dark skin. It's simply through a mutation. No aliens. No. They found the gene that is responsible for creating the RH protein. In RH negative people, this gene is either switched off or is completely absent. This does create a little bit of an evolutionary biological mystery, though. You see why? No, but I think you might be about to explain it to me. Well, here's how the argument goes, is how would it be evolutionary beneficial to develop a trait that might cause harm to your offspring? I can't see in any way how it would be. Yeah. So if you randomly got this mutation and you're a female and you're RH negative, then you mate with a population of RH positive men, a lot of your offspring will either die or have issues, right? How is that going to help in any way from an evolutionary perspective? Mm -hmm. It turns out that the answer to this question might have something to do with our old buddy toxoplasmosis that we talked about in our cat podcast. Do go on. Research has found that RH negative people do perform better in reaction time tests versus RH positive individuals for one reason or another. They react quicker? Like they move faster? Yeah, they have faster reaction times, which would benefit you living in the wild because faster reaction time would mean that you might be a better hunter or that you could avoid danger easier. Obviously, they have alien blood in them. However, when they looked at toxoplasmosis infected individuals, they found that RH positive individuals' reaction times didn't decrease noticeably. Because toxoplasmosis has this effect on you where it can retard your reaction time. And make you obsessed with cats. Yes, and want to collect cats. But RH negative people infected with toxoplasmosis saw a marked change in reaction time and performed even worse in reaction time than the non-infected RH positive people. So you can see that there would be a benefit if you were living in a place where there's high levels of toxoplasmosis to be RH positive because infection with toxoplasmosis wouldn't affect your livelihood by decreasing your reaction times. Well, the workaround would be to microdose on small amounts of magic mushrooms to increase your reflexes. Yeah. I'm doing a callback. I know, callback to shit. Booyah! Mm-mm-mm. So there is a genetic benefit for being RH negative because you have a faster reaction time unless you're RH negative and living in a place where there's lots of cats. So you'd be doomed if you were in Egypt. Exactly. Because what they have found is the largest populations of RH negative people 
come from Europe, which have not many indigenous cat species. The highest levels of RH positive people come from Asia, which is full of cat species. Therein lies the answer. I'm not saying it's aliens, but... It's aliens. It's not aliens. It's just simple genetics. I like the aliens better. Previously on Dirty Talk After After Hours. Yeah, you ready for this final volley? I'm ready. All right, let's, let's do, do it. All right, hunker down. Oh shit! It looks like they're regrouping. Ah! What are they doing over there? Oh crap! Ah! Incoming! Ah! After Hours, available exclusively on Patreon every Monday morning. If you do want to get access to the Dirty Talk After Hours podcast, you can get it in one of two ways. You can follow Rain de Grey on Patreon at patreon.com backslash Rain de Grey. You have to type it out exactly. I'm not searchable because I'm naughty. She has been blacklisted. She's in the adult ghetto. I'm a bad, bad girl. Or you can head on over to our brand spanking new shiny Dirty Talk podcast Patreon, which is patreon.com backslash Dirty Talk podcast. Either way, if you pledge at $5 a month, you will get exclusive weekly access to the Dirty Talk After Hours podcast. Your Japanese blood discrimination and bloodline of the gods was some fascinating stuff, and I'm going to bring something a little heavier to the table. And when I say a little heavier, it's actually, uh, buckle up your seatbelts, this is going to be a little bit grim. I am going to talk about the Romanian HIV crisis that specifically affected children. And this topic is actually pretty relevant in this day and age because of the sweeping repeals we're having of abortion and how we're starting to have real issues of restricting abortion to women. What sort of sweeping issues would abortion restriction have? I'm about to tell you how such restrictions affected an entire country for generations. To say that Romania has a complex relationship with blood would be putting it mildly. While Romania is best known as the birthplace of Dracula, although it was then known as Transylvania, there is another much lesser known massacre of innocents that did not involve putting people on pikes. In the 1960s, Romania was under the leadership of the communist dictator Nicolae Ceaușescu. He was hyper-focused on growing and increasing the population of his country under the impression that it would lead to economic growth. And in order to do so, 
he banned all abortion and contraception. In October 1966, Decree 770 was enacted, which banned abortion except in cases where the mother was over 40 or she already had four children. By 1977, people were being taxed for being childless. So strict was the hardline stance on baby making that women were actually subjected to regular gynecological exams at their place of work in order to make sure that any possible pregnancies could be detected before they went and had an illegal abortion. They were determined to make their population crank out as many babies as possible. So they would show up to the workplace and say, hey, surprise inspection. Drop your drawers and spread them. We are about to check your uterus to make sure that you're not hiding any embryos in there. Because you women can't be trusted and we know that you're just going to scamper off and have an abortion. Yep. Before we can get that sweet, sweet kid. (laughs) Exactly that. (laughs) The consequence of these laws was exactly what was intended. The population exploded. But along with this population explosion came an unfortunate side effect. Parents did not have the financial resources to properly care for all of these babies they were forced to have. Without the means to support all these extra babies, the surplus children ended up in state-run orphanages. Conditions in these orphanages were, as you might expect, grim. Lacking such basic supplies as food and clothing, an ingenious plan was hatched to nourish all of these sickly surplus children. Blood transfusions. Oh, yeah, of course. If you can't feed them, give them blood? Yep. We might not be able to feed you, oh, unwanted baby, but we can jam some stranger's blood into your tiny veins as a pick-me-up. Honestly, what is it with Romania and blood? There was only one small problem. What was this small problem? The blood they were injecting into babies was completely untested, and because of severely limited supplies, one needle could be reused up to 80 times. Where were they getting all this blood? Were they just drafting random people in the population and demanding their blood? No, 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 no. That's where it's super jacked up. The bulk of this blood was coming from alcoholics and junkies. They had centers where you could come in and offer your blood and they would pay you for it. So the average rank and file was too busy living their life. They didn't have time to go sell their blood. They were doing stuff, but it was the lower end of the population that needed money for drugs or alcohol that was happily giving up their blood at these centers. They would take the blood out of these homeless alcoholics and junkies and then send that blood without testing over the orphanages and inject it into infants. So it was more economically feasible to pay these indigents for their blood than to take that money and feed the children. Correct. (laughs) Okay. Okay. I'm with you. As a result of these policies, HIV positive blood could be gifted up to 80 children in one go, creating an epidemic that swept the country. Exact numbers on just how many children were affected are impossible to say, as once the effects of reusing syringes started to manifest, the government clamped down as only a communist dictatorship could. No records or documentations were allowed. A brave face must be maintained. We have no dying babies. We cannot confirm nor deny the existence of dead babies. There are none. Everything's fine. Yay, communism. Communism, the system that works for you. (laughs) Lacking resources and the expensive medical care that HIV maintenance requires, many of these children died. The ones that did not die were shunned by regular Romanian society. Nobody wanted these sick surplus babies. In 1989, Nicola was ousted, and after an extremely speedy trial, he and his wife were executed by firing squad. The effects of his determination to increase Romanians' population by whatever means necessary are still felt to this day. 
Across Romania, there is an estimated 9,000 HIV-positive children, more than half of the total in Europe as a whole. These children are most likely doomed to lead short lives, as Romania's weakened economy still lacks the resources to assist them. So they weren't successful in stimulating the economy at all. They were only successful in poisoning their own population and ensuring that a whole generation of people are going to get sick and die. Correct. (sighs) Genius. Regulate. (laughs) Genius. Regulate those uteruses. What could possibly go wrong? I think the takeaway here is let people decide what they want to do with their own bodies or else you're going to seriously fuck shit up. No joke. Dictators often leave their mark in bloody and unforeseen ways And Nicola's regime stands out as being remarkable in the ways in which it affected a country for generations. Who knows if Romania will ever get over their blood obsession or not? I'm voting probably not. At least they are no longer randomly injecting infants with untested blood in the name of good health. Unexpected blood draw today. You haven't had anything to eat yet? No. Okay. Not since 8 o'clock yesterday. Okay. Good job. Let's get it on. Right? That's fine to me. Mm-hmm. We practice on both. Oh. I shouldn't say practice. We do both. Yeah. Well, I've always been told I have good veins for it. Yeah. Okay, listen. Yeah, tight fist. Just close your hand. Uh, I hate the feeling. The blood escaping yeah. your body. Yeah, it's just it's such a strange feeling to the poke and then feeling it kind of drain. Well, the tourniquet, I think, is also yeah. a feeling. Yeah. Finger right on there for me. Yeah. 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 yeah, you can't really prepare for it. No, no. Unplanned or not. Because it gets kind of commonplace. Poking people every day. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I've been doing this 35 years. All right. Well, thank you. You're welcome. Yeah. It's, um, Everybody's there, though. Yeah. I'm sure you get some people more squeamish than others. Oh, yeah. All right. Thank you. Bye. Are you feeling down? Low energy? Do you no longer have the vim and passion of your youth? Don't fall for the hyped-up claims of trendy supplements that promise to reignite the zeal of your younger days, but aren't backed up by real scientific research. There is an alternative. We here at Ambrosia care about you. We want to help you turn back the clock to recapture the vitality you felt in your glory days. How are we going to do that, you ask? Simple by replacing your blood with that of a younger man. No longer will you have to deal with the time-consuming headache and boring process of finding your own blood boy. Let us do the heavy work for you. Also, you'll be doing your part to advance scientific knowledge as a whole. Here's how it works. Ambrosia has registered with the U.S. government to perform clinical trials to evaluate the beneficial effects of infusions of plasma from young donors. Each patient in our clinical trial will receive an infusion of plasma derived from a young donor 16 to 25 years of age. Studies done on mice at Stanford suggest that the circulation of blood from young mice seems to invigorate older mice. So we say, why not with humans too? We want to help invigorate you. So what are you waiting for? Join our clinical trial today. It only costs $8,000 a liter to have that sweet, sweet blood of youth pumped directly into your withering, decaying veins. But that's not all, because we've got a twofer deal for you. Get two liters of blood delivered fresh from a virile millennial to you. It won't cost you $16,000. It won't cost you $14,000. We're going crazy. Two liters of that tasty scarlet kick-you-in-your-pants essence of life for only $12,000. Don't delay. Act today. Operators are standing by. (laughs) 
sounds like a funny premise, right? Indeed. Except that Ambrosia was an actual company and they were honestly offering this service to their customers all in the guise of doing a legitimate clinical study. Is this actual company still around? No, they are not. And I will explain why. Pray tell. The now defunct company was founded in 2016 by Jesse Carmazin, a Stanford-trained doctor. Carmazin promised extraordinary results from this procedure, going so far as claiming that his treatment comes pretty close to immortality. The company was able to offer this service because of a couple of loopholes. The first being their application for a clinical trial of this technique. And the second loophole was since blood transfusions were already approved by federal regulators, Ambrosia didn't need to demonstrate that its treatment carried significant benefits before offering it to customers. Creepy. The response to the company's offerings were pretty well received. Yeah, because nobody wants to die. Exactly. Everybody's holding out hope for one last little bit of oomph. I'll just take a miracle, any miracle. Give me your blood, all of your fresh young blood that'll help me live forever. <laughs> At its height, the company was offering their blood transfusion service in five different cities across the country, charging their customers eight grand a pop for a liter of young blood. And they did have a buy one, get one half off offer, which you could conveniently pay for via PayPal. The mark of any reputable company, buy our thousands of dollars of fresh young blood through PayPal. But honestly, who doesn't love a bargain? Most of us love a bargain. I love a bargain. And you get to live forever? Yes, please. <laughs> Would you have tried their blood? Fuck no. <laughs> It was estimated that the company had a client base of a couple hundred people and the average age being around 60. Just when you start to feel the icy grip of death on the exactly. back of your neck. Exactly. All of these people were willing to fork out thousands of dollars for the slim possibility of restored youth. But did it work? Well, most of Ambrosia's claims of veracity surrounding this treatment came from studies surrounding parabiosis, which is a laboratory procedure where two living organisms are stitched together to share a common circulatory system to study the effects on the two subjects. Uh, that's some serious Frankenstein shit. Yeah, it sounds like the kind of stuff that Joseph Mengele would have been doing. That's always a good, solid foundation for your work, yes. All over the country, there are little mice tied together in laboratories. Uh, well, stitched together? Little mices? Stitched together and sharing a circulatory system. Um, that's deeply disturbing. Science. There have been a number of experiments joining young mice to old ones to see if the elder mice benefit from the juvenile blood. But so far, all these experiments have yielded mixed results. So you have an old mouse stitched together to a fresh mouse like some weird Franken-mouse and they're staggering into cage walls? Yep. Uh... Living as strange mutant conjoined twins. Miserable mice. Also in 2014, Dr. Saul Villeda at UCSF led a study in which the blood plasma of three-month-old mice was injected into 18-month-old mice. Now, take into account that a mouse's lifespan is only about two years. So these would have been geriatric mice. Serious senior citizen micey. Saul Valeda said that older mice performed significantly better after the infusion. It might actually have some benefits then? Well, the company itself stated that their research garnered impressive results claiming that young plasma injections were reversing Alzheimer's symptoms and lowering blood cholesterol. So then spending eight grand to have youthful blood injected into your aging veins seems reasonable. Yeah, except that the company never made any of their research public and they could never verify any of these claims. So they were selling Scarlet Hope in a bottle? Pretty much. Unfortunately for Ambrosia, in February of 2019, 
the FDA released a statement saying, The Food and Drug Administration is advising consumers to be cautious about establishments offering infusions of plasma obtained from young human donors with the claim that the infused plasma will treat a variety of conditions ranging from normal aging to memory loss. There is no proven clinical benefits of the infusion of plasma from young donors. The dosing of these infusions, which can involve large administered volumes, is also not guided by evidence from adequate and well-controlled trials. In addition, the infusion of plasma can be associated with infectious, allergic, respiratory, and cardiovascular risks. The statement went on to say, even though blood products are screened for a variety of different infectious agents, there is always a residual risk that the product may contain an infectious agent. The infusion of plasma is occasionally associated with serious allergic reactions, including anaphylaxis, which can manifest as hives and airway obstruction. Infusion of plasma can occasionally cause transfusion-related acute lung injury. And in some individuals, particularly those with existing heart disease, which <clears throat> the elder 60-year-old patients might probably have, mm -hmm. the infusion of plasma can cause overload of the circulatory system, leading to swelling of the body and difficulty breathing. Sweet, sweet youth. Anything to get young. One of the issues surrounding what Ambrosia was doing was the sheer volume of blood they were giving their patients. Humans have roughly four and a half to five and a half liters of blood in them. And they were selling a liter at a time. Since no one can donate a full liter of blood, the company had to purchase the blood from blood banks and then combine the blood from multiple different donors into a single blood cocktail, which they would then inject into their customers. When you're dealing with multiple donors, you're compounding the risks of a negative reaction to the transfusion. Ambrosia was replacing upwards of 20% of their patient's blood with that of numerous random individuals, a process that had to take place over a couple of days because of the volume of blood that they were replacing in the person's body. This essentially disproves the Keith Richards full blood transfusion theory then because it would have taken too long. He wouldn't have been able to survive having all of his blood hoovered out and then non-opiate addicted blood being replaced in order for him to go on tour. I looked into the Keith Richards thing and could find no verifiable evidence that he ever got his blood replaced. Like gerbils and Richard Gere. Something that sounds good but is too good to be true. That was my thought exactly. Just like gerbils and Richard Gere. After the FDA announcement, Ambrosia stopped offering its blood replacement service and the company completely dissolved. No immortality for you. Nope. But the bright side is, thankfully, everyone has learned their lesson from this Ambrosia farce, and no one will ever again fall for questionable products and procedures promising the elusive fountain of youth. Nope. Not ever. Never going to happen. Nope. <coughs> <coughs> Hey everyone, this is Rain de Grey. If you want to keep tabs on me and check out all the cool stuff I'm doing, you can head on over to my website, raindegray.com, and while you're there, sign up for my newsletter so that you and I can stay in touch. And if you are on Twitter, check me out at either Rain de Grey or the Dirty Talk Cast. Dirty Talk Podcast has a new Twitter. Just search Twitter for Dirty Talk Podcast or add us at Dirty Talk Cast. Oot. When I think blood, two main people come to mind. The first, obviously, Dracula. Dracula. But the second one that comes to mind is Elizabeth Bathory. Like Bathory, the black metal band from Sweden. They named themselves after Elizabeth Bathory. I know. Blood Countess. Prolific serial killer. Madwoman. Of course, a band would name themselves after such a legendary figure. Elizabeth Bathory, she who dances in the blood of young women suspended in spiked cages, raining down upon her head 
as they desperately backed into the spikes to avoid being stabbed by red-hot pokers thrust between the cage bars. A countess that got started on her path of murder and mayhem after boxing a servant girl's ears so severely that her blood landed on her skin. Wiping away the blood afterwards, Elizabeth believed that the skin beneath had magically become younger, defying the cruel march of time. This vain woman was, from that moment on, determined to magically extract the anti-aging properties of blood from those around her in the most painful ways possible, a determination that eventually led to her bathing in tubs of blood. Surely, Elizabeth is one of the most evil women in all of history, right? Well, I can't think of anybody worse. Yeah, that's what I'd always believed as well. The story of her showering in blood of women suspended above her was one that I had heard years ago that ended up being permanently burned into my memory. She seemed like a natural fit for this podcast. But a funny thing happened along the way while I was doing the research on her. Funny haha, like funny like a clown? No, although I appreciate that reference. <laughs> there is a more than middling chance that most, if not all of the stuff about her, was made up. As opposed to being a vain and sadistic psychopath with a love for blood, she was something even worse than that. An uppity woman? Ha <laughs> ha! Exactly that. She was an extremely wealthy widow from one of the most powerful families in the entire country. With truly staggering amounts of financial resources at her disposal and no current husband, Elizabeth was unchecked, concentrated power. Whoever she might end up marrying next could easily end up on the throne and ruling over all of Hungary. Rather than let such a powerful peace remain on the board, steps were taken. It was basically... Game of Thrones OG style. What better way to remove a player off the board than accuse her of being a blood-obsessed serial killer that tortured her staff in the cruelest ways possible? While there is no doubt that she is arrogant, strict, and cruel, the body count that by some estimations reached over 600 people appears to be a fabrication. Aww. Her servants confessed under torture. People will say anything to get torture to stop. I think that's why they call it torture, that because so you want it to stop and you're willing to do anything. Correct. Yeah, if you torture someone, they'll say anything. And in this case, they are saying that Elizabeth was doing the worst things to people imaginable, like bathing in blood. She was never granted a trial, and she was never allowed to speak out in her defense. After she was bricked up in her room with only a small slot for food to be passed through until the day she died, most of her family records were destroyed. Hmm, a little suspicious. A little suspicious. We will never be able to say for sure, as we were not there personally while things were going down, but it is highly likely that this haughty and heavy-handed woman only killed a handful of servants at most, not the hundreds she was accused of. Oh, so she was just... A mild, mild murderer. Right, right, right. Not a mass murderer. Right, right, right. She was strict. She took no shit. Her husband was away at war a lot. She definitely was not a woman to be trifled with. Was she heavy-handed in some servants? Yes. Did she kill 600 people while dancing in suspended cages with their blood like some fucking Looney Tune? Nah. Oh, well, so yeah. You know, she only killed a handful of folks. So, sure. Back in the day, that was... <laughs> Pretty <normal. laughs> low numbers. Low for numbers <laughs> for hungry. Yeah. By hanging the label of vain, sadistic serial killer around her neck, one of the most powerful players in the game was neatly removed off the board and sent to her room to cool her heels until she died of old age. The rumors of her bathing in tubs of fresh blood were a complete fabrication. I've looked it up. The blood would coagulate into stinky jelly had she tried as blood is a very ineffective medium for bathing in. Yeah, it gets pretty viscous fairly fast. It's just stinky jello with flies. It's not going to keep you young. No. I think we got an ad campaign there. 
<laughs> Stinky Jello with flies. Virgin blood. Throughout history, being too rich and too powerful always put a target on your back. The more research I did, the more I became convinced that Elizabeth inadvertently wound up the victim of the target on her back. So her main crime was being a woman that found herself in the seat of power. Yep. Oh. Well. Take her down, lock her up. Take away her pockets. No, yeah, you know what happens when they get pockets? They get way too uppity. Yep. Speaking of women and blood. Do go on. From the beginning of time, there is one thing that every human population has had to deal with on a regular basis when it comes to blood. Menstruation. Menstruation. Also known as the moon cycle. Riding the crimson wave. Ant flows come to town. Shark week. That time of the month. Eve's curse. One of my favorites from Denmark. There are communists in the fun house. <laughs> That's hilarious. Dracula's tea bag. Ooh. Riding the cotton pony. Lady business. There are many different terms that many different cultures have come up to describe this occurrence. We could keep going, but we're going to stop because you get the point. And in most cultures, menstruation is considered to be a taboo subject. People get really squicky about blood. Did you know that menstruation is literally taboo? The word taboo comes from the Polynesian word tapua, which means both sacred and menstruation. Roughly, it's something that's off limits. I did not know that. That's fascinating. So menstruation is literally taboo. Every culture has dealt with this reoccurring phenomenon in its own way. Menstruating women have often been seen as having great power and magic. However, this power is often viewed as extremely destructive. That seems to be how women have been viewed for all of human history. In ancient Rome, Pliny the Elder wrote in his Natural History that when women had their periods, they could stop seeds from germinating, cause plants to wither, and make fruit fall from trees. But their destructive power had its uses. A menstruating woman was able to kill a swarm of bees <laughs> just by the power of menstruation or ward off hail and lightning. I've had my period and walked near bees, and none of those bees died. Mm, you just weren't bleeding hard enough. Evidently not. Wives of farmers, Pliny suggested, could even offer a sort of pesticide. According to him, If a woman strips herself naked while she is menstruating and walks around a field of wheat, the caterpillars, worms... Beetles and other vermin will fall from off the ears of corn. I have a question. If that was a belief, and as a farmer, you don't want the caterpillars and the vermin on your corn, you only need to try that for a couple of months, sending your bleeding spouse wandering through your fields, and then afterwards you'd be like, all these caterpillars are still here. This is nonsense, right? Your problem is that you are trying to apply a logic to an illogical situation. On the island of Wogeo in New Guinea, it is believed that the touch of a menstruating woman can kill a man. I have touched you frequently while I was menstruating and you are still alive and drawing breath. Just barely so. <laughs> Their culture also has a very dark view on sexual intercourse. Exactly how dark, my friend? They believe that coitus is neither shameful nor immoral, but it is simply extremely dangerous. In what way? Well, after intercourse, both men and women have to bathe, and men even avoid touching their penis. And they squat when they urinate. Also, both parties need to purify themselves of the contamination of the opposite sex. They do this through menstruation. For women, this happens naturally. 
But for the men, this is a laborious ordeal. As it's described in the book, The Island of Menstruating Men, Religion in Wogeo. The technique of male menstruation is as follows. First, the man catches a crayfish or crab and removes one of its claws. From dawn onwards on the day, he eats nothing. Then, late in the afternoon, he goes to a lonely beach and wades out till the water is up to his knees. He stands there with legs apart and induces an erection. When ready, he pushes back the foreskin and hacks the glands. Above all, he must not allow the blood to fall on his fingers or legs. After wrapping the penis in leaves, he dresses and goes back to the village. Sexual intercourse is forbidden until the next new moon. Some people don't see menstruation as an evil thing, but might even have magical healing properties. Abbess Hildegard of Bingen, who lived from 1098 to 1179, wrote that leprosy, which she believed was caused by either lust or intemperance, could be cured by washing in the nourishing properties of menstrual blood as much as you can get. Galen, the Greek father of anatomy, thought that women's regular bleeding was due to their laziness. Their blood humor would build up from inactivity and have to escape their body. He is quoted as saying, I imagine that the female sex, inasmuch as they heap up great quantities of humors, by living continually at home and not being used for hard labor or exposed to the sun, should receive a discharge of this fullness as a remedy given by nature. Unfortunately, these backwards ideas aren't limited to the superstitious folk beliefs of our pre-scientific time. In 1920, an Austrian doctor named Bella Schick postulated a theory that menstruating women produce a toxic substance which can be secreted through their sweat. He named it menotoxin. His proof? What was his proof? He conducted experiments in which he said flowers held by a menstruating woman wilted faster than those held by a non-menstruating control subject. What? Very scientific. And dough needed by a menstruating woman did not rise as high as dough needed by their counterpart. So menstruating women are just leaking poison. They have poison in them, which comes out in their blood and sweat while they menstruate. It sounds like men being scared of pussy. His findings were actually taken seriously, were debated, and apparently warranted further study in the scientific community. In the 1950s, at Harvard University, a study was conducted to find out if menotoxin was present in menstrual blood. And? Two specialists in diseases of the reproductive organs injected little animals with menstrual blood, and when they died, they took it as proof of poison in the blood. Maybe the animals did not like being injected with menses. Another doctor came along to disprove their results what he did was mixed antibiotics with the blood and then injected the animals and the animals didn't die, thereby proving that it wasn't poison in the blood that was killing the animals, but bacteria. But the search for menotoxin didn't end there. The theory kept popping up in medical journals as late as the 1970s. As humorous as some of these misconceptions are, there's also a very serious ignorance surrounding menstruation that still exists today, causing women all over the world to suffer needlessly. That sounds like all of human history when it comes to being a woman. I'm just saying. Many women are forced to sleep in menstruation huts every month while bleeding. I've heard about the menstruation huts, yeah. These huts are little more than cattle pens that provide minimal shelter and are usually highly unsanitary. In Nepal... This practice of forcing women out of their homes to live in substandard conditions only became illegal in 2017. Really? Yes. But the law is still ignored in many villages. Naturally. As recently as January 2019, a mother 
and her two sons were found dead in one of these small huts. What did they die of? They lit a fire in an attempt to fight off the bitter cold of the Nepalese sub-zero winter. However, the small makeshift structure didn't have adequate ventilation, and the three were killed by smoke inhalation during the night. How much you want to bet that the husband was more distraught about the loss of his sons than his wife? I care not to wager on that because I'm sure that you would probably win. Mm -hmm. So there are some funny myths and superstitions surrounding menstruation, but I think it's time to come into a time of enlightenment and realize that it's a natural process that we are all here because of. Slow progress forward, my friend. That's about all the time we have for blood today. Well, that's not true. We have a lot more blood, but it's we're going to put it on our after hours. We do have a lot more blood, but in the interest of not making this a three-hour-long podcast, we figured that there was some stuff we needed to leave out. Because in our research, we came upon a lot of interesting things relating to blood. So much blood. So do please join us for our Dirty Talk After Hours podcast, available exclusively on our Patreon. You can go to patreon.com backslash rain to gray or patreon.com backslash dirty talk podcast to get access to those. You can't search for you on there because you are in the dirty, naughty I'm a back alley. Bad, bad girl. You have to go directly to the link if you just put in Rain to Gray. It's like I'm not there. So far, the Dirty Talk podcast is not naughty. You can still search for Dirty Talk podcast on Patreon. Right, right. That's the workaround because I'm such a bad person. The Dirty Talk podcast can be found on iTunes, Google Play Music, Spotify, Stitcher, Spreaker, TuneIn Radio, and iHeartRadio. Please follow, rate, and review. And I want to put out my challenge that I put out every time. If you have enjoyed this podcast, I'm challenging you to go tell at least one person about it. We couldn't do it without your help. And... We wouldn't be doing it without you listening to it because then it would just be the two of us staring at each other across my bed and talking about weird, dirty things. Which is what we do all the time, but it's more fun if you're part of it. Exactly. We hope you enjoyed Blood and we want you to join us next time for... Come! Yes, come along and join us as we explore the wonderful world of... Come. <laughs> oh, I've got some good stuff. And if you want to be included in the next Come podcast, give us a call and leave us a message on the answering machine. The number is 614-733-4739 or 614-R-DeGray. We hope to see you next time as we come all over this podcast. <laughs> Pervert. Oh, before I forget, before we leave, we, when we did our blood tests in the bathroom, did a video. Yes, we did. And we will post that video on Patreon. It's me being a little squeamish because I was a big wussy pants. You were afraid of the needle. I don't like needles. So if you're a Patreon supporter, go check out the video. If you want to see the behind the scenes of part of what we did for crafting this podcast, and see Chris be much braver about the needle than I, we are going to post the footage of us testing our blood. little bonus extra there for our supporters. Right. Uh, don't watch it if you're scared of blood. Or you got blood everywhere. I was very juicy. You were flinging your blood all over the place. Flinging? <laughs> just... I don't... That squeezing it out of your fingers. No, it just it was just gushing for. I'm a woman, you know. It's, we gush with all so that just blood. Just used to bleeding. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I didn't kill any bees in the process. Anyways, if you want to see it, we'll see you on Patreon. Till next time, my friends. Bye. Blood is um uh yucky. Okay. Bye. <laughs> <laughs>